Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to, to our session today. My name is Mario Stokas, and I am the organizer and the Zoom moderator for today's event. So before, before we begin, allow me to introduce the chairs for today's uh, session, uh, Ms. Wendy Miles and Dr. Marcus Gering. Wendy Miles is a specialist in international arbitration dispute resolution with a focus on pu uh, private and public international law at 20 Essex. She has sat as an arbitrator, a sole arbitrator, co-arbitrator, and a chair under many major arbitral institutions. She has also been appointed by the United Kingdom as part of the exit panel of arbitrators and conciliators, and also in the field of climate change and finance. Uh, Ms. Miles has acted as a global co uh, coordinated council to various major corporations in relation to climate change transition, disclosure, reporting, compliance and investment. Uh, Dr. Marcus Gering, he is a director at the Center for European Legal Studies at Cambridge University. He's also a fellow and director of studies in law at Hughes Hall and a fellow of the Lauterpath Center for International Law at Cambridge University. And he's also the lead counsel for sustainable trade, investment and finance and the Center for uh, of International Sustainable Development Law. The floor is now uh, yours, uh, Marcus. Thank you very much, uh, Marius. And we have a, um, uh, a very, hopefully, very interesting program uh, for this um, uh, early afternoon session um, here at the ISD hub uh, in Geneva. Uh, thank you again to the organizers of this splendid uh, online event. And without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Professor Marie-Claire Cordonius Seger is the Leverhulme Trust Visiting Professor at the University of Cambridge Bennett Institute. She's also the Senior Director of uh, one of the main organizers of the session, the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, and a full professor of international law at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, she's been um, the senior executive secretary for the Climate Law and Governance Initiative and is a fellow and director of studies at Lucy Cavendish College in the University of Cambridge. Uh, Mary Claire, you've got the floor. Oh, thank you very much. And I wonder if my slides could be put up, please. I'm just waiting for the, the slides for my presentation. Thank you, perfect. So I'm actually just going to give a few opening remarks based on a study of about nine years that was published this year. Um, I, with Oxford University Press. And the name of the study was Athena's Treaties, Crafting Trade and Investment Accords for Sustainable Development. And I'll just sort of do the obligatory show the book. There we go. Now, now you've seen the book. Um, I can put it down and actually speak about the issues. Um, so next slide, please. We live in an extremely complex and globalized economy. The slide that you are looking at now shows the intensity of global trade and investment routes. And we are linked by a web of national authorities, WTO commitments, UNCITRAL, ICSID, and other rules, as well as an increasingly complex network of regional and bilateral economic accords. Indeed, in 2021, 340 odd free trade agreements were in force with the WTO notified of 548. OECD and UNCTAD list over 2,298 bilateral investment treaties, plus at least 324 treaties that include both trade and investment commitments. Economic flows are significant, but also fragile. Global FDI flows decreased by nearly 40% in 2020, and the export value of tra goods traded dropped from US 20.47 trillion to US 17.5 trillion in 2020, possibly as impacts of the global COVID-19 pandemic set in. Next slide, please. And I'll actually ask if Marcus doesn't mind just passing me the slides as well um, that have come off the printer. But let's go to, go to the next slide. Thank you. So 
when we look at risks to the global economy, and we look in particular at risks um, of COVID-19, we actually need to take into account a growing and indeed very difficult context that is much more complex than just economic risks. We are looking at people being driven, millions and millions being driven into poverty, and the Human Development Index already had very uneven rates of access to basic needs like food and shelter and education um, uh, worldwide. At the same time, we're seeing a shattering of global planetary boundaries with climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation, indeed nitrogen and phosphorus flows literally already having passed the safe levels. And we're seeing the impacts of a COVID-19 pandemic, which about which we were warned by the World Health Organization as late as the August 2019 report, where they said that the world was not prepared for a global pandemic um, of respiratory disease. Um, and the impacts on trade have been, well, quite abrupt and shocking. Next slide, please. One of the most important points that we need to keep in mind when we consider the impact of trade and investment on uh, economic recovery after COVID-19 and contributions in particular to the world's sustainable development goals is that trade by itself has the opportunity to either help or hinder sustainable development. And indeed, concerns have been raised about the environmental, social, and even economic impacts of trade and investment. Many governments prior to treaties now do impact assessments. And these studies identify the scale, scope, and technology impacts of increased flows, absent mitigation and enhancement processes. And we're looking, for example, at global fossil fuel subsidies and trade. We're looking at um, trade being said to embody 17 to 30 percent of biodiversity loss, um, uh, 15 to 38 percent of global problematic labor, um, 62 to 64 percent of global metal ore extraction, and 70 percent of global coal exploitation, as well as 23 to 30 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Indeed, one study even showed that international trade subsidizes CO2 emissions by up to 800 billion per annum. Um, so I'll go to the next slide in order to then give um, a few slightly more positive messages. And in particular, what I'd like to point out is that these global wicked problems and these complexities are maybe increasing in severity and impact but they're not truly surprises. The international community has been working very hard over a number of decades, nearly a century actually, if not more, in order to try to find solutions. Next slide, please. And these solutions are particularly um, cr crucial when we look at whether or not we can identify a common policy agenda that we can all be working towards, including in our trade and investment negotiations and in the mitigation and um, sequencing and um, enhancement measures that were mentioned earlier as ways to prevent trade from harming or rather than helping um, a, the delivery of the world's sustainable development goals and the economic recovery after COVID. So there is actually a common global policy agenda now. And indeed, the sustainable development goals were adopted in 2015. These are 17 goals with 169 targets, some concerning the biosphere, some concerning society, some concerning economy. And for all countries, developed or developing, they offer a succinct set of public policy priorities and time bond targets. Next slide, please. So what I think is important to note is that the sustainable development goals, of course, are not, are not absent a reference to trade. And indeed, especially in um, sustainable development goal 10 on equality and sustainable development goal 17 on the partnership for the goals, there are commitments to um, achieving a universal rules-based open non-discriminatory and equitable multilateral trading system, as well as encouraging foreign investment that can support sustainable development, free market, market access for all least developed countries, et cetera. It's very much a question of how can trade and investment actually help rather than hinder achievement of the sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. 
And we have some actual studies that uh, begin to give us some ideas of where we can start for those uh, enhancement measures and those mitigation measures. Indeed, in order to better understand risks and identify options, international organizations and national authorities are conducting impact assessments to identify potential environmental and social effects of new economic agreements. And what we're seeing in these impact assessments, I mean, if you sort of summarize nine years of research in, in three points, is that there are actually three main tensions that can be observed in the law and also that can be found by analyzing the impact assessments of the potential laws and their impacts. First, obligations can constrain the adoption or implementation of new regulations to meet other international treaty commitments on sustainable development. Second, pre-existing social and environmental challenges in the countries that are trading partners can be directly or indirectly exacerbated by growing trade and investment flows occasioned by a new treaty. And third, trade investment agreements may incentivize economic growth of an unsustainable nature. So those are our three tensions. And my concluding slides will actually focus on, of course, some of the solutions to those. Next slide, please. We have looked throughout the regional trade agreements that have been um, uh, signed over the last three or four decades, and in particular considered 340 odd, plus about 2,300 bilateral investment treaties, and focusing especially on the 320 plus trade and investment accords to try to find a few examples of the innovations on sustainable agriculture, green energy, climate change, green goods and services, et cetera, that could align with the sustainable development goals. And in the study, we've been able to come out with some really interesting answers. Next slide, please. We've seen quite a few innovations. And what we've looked at in particular is innovations that can address those three tensions. And um, even though the formatting has changed a little bit on these slides for some reason, I think that we can say that our study of the 340 odd treaties that touch on both trade and investment, and particularly the ones that contain direct contrasts and direct commitments, we can see that trade and investment flows can and should support the sustainable development goals. Many options exist to address sustainability concerns, including the adoption of diverse domestic legal, economic and policy flank measures or safeguards to mitigate those negative impacts and to enhance the positives. Trailered international legal measures can be crafted within the trade and investment agreements themselves to address the most significant concerns directly. And the comparative analysis of about 110 of the agreements that address sustainable development the most and the most creatively shows that states are indeed already testing diverse trade investment and sustainability innovations. Next slide, please. So I'm going to simply outline the three answers to the three tensions and, um, and, and, and then conclude. First, of course, um, prior to the three answers, we do note that many of the treaties are actually including as their purpose setting sustainable development as an object or principle of the bilateral regional investment um, or trade accord. And this isn't just happening in the WTO, it's happened in NAFTA style treaties, it's happened in, in the EU's partnership agreements and as economic association agreements, and it's happening more and more often in the bilateral treaties that we see. Next slide, please. So accepting that the regional trade investment treaties have set this as a, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, a purpose or objective of their agreement, um, that means also that the provisions in the agreement will be interpreted in that light, as, as all international lawyers know. And the per types of provisions that could be interpreted that way in particular include, for example, in terms of responding to tension one, exceptions for sustainability measures. And we see many different examples of types of exceptions from economic disciplines where obligations might otherwise constrain SD regulators. General exceptions, specific exceptions, explicit non-application notes, and general interpretive statements are some of the most obvious ones. Next slide, please. 
Addressing the second tension, we can see a second pathway where actually within the treaties themselves, there are cooperation measures or cooperation mechanisms or um, uh, joint trade on sustainable development or environmental goods and services um, trade um, uh, promotion um, uh, measures. And in particular, what we're finding is that running parallel to the economic relationship, sort of apart from it almost, there's a set of additional global green deal type provisions, which um, provide parallel agreements or chapters for cooperation on environment, social or sustainable development priorities, jointly coordinate new institutions, adopt common work programs on specific social environmental projects, often accompanied by capacity building, technology transfer or financing commitments, or even factual report and complaints mechanisms that ensure that environmental laws or human rights laws can actually be um, uh, challenged and, and, and reinforced rather than the, quote, NAFTA style race to the bottom. And, and there's some examples of that on the screen, but I won't go into them. I'll just go straight to the third tension and the pathway that has been found forward. Because I think that third one, please, next slide, is actually the most exciting one. And that is, of course, the actual integrated increases in trade and investment that go towards sustainable goods and services. And in particular, that go toward sustainable trade and investment more broadly. And we see many, many new examples of this. And I think it's the most exciting one because it leverages the exact economic relationship between the parties to the treaties, turns it around and turns it towards sustainable trade. And, and, and that is, I think, still the most exciting place to go. And it matches the best with the types of commitments we're seeing, for example, in the newly um, uh, defined and, and, and operationalized Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, especially Article 6.2 and Article 6.4. So trade and investment enhancement commitments for sustainable development. The response to the tension about promoting trade in obsolete or unsustainable products is that we promote trade and investment, but we do it in the sustainable products instead. The ones that we've agreed in other multilateral treaty regimes need to be promoted and indeed um, uh, supported. I've got a whole list of the types of trade and investment disciplines that can be used to do this. I'm not going to walk through all of them, but I will just highlight technical barriers to trade provisions, which improve certification processes, promoting mutual recognition of sustainability standards, or government procurement provisions, which make public purchasing of sustainable goods and services more affordable, or investment provisions like the ones I negotiated when I worked for the Canadian government, which make socially responsible corporations just as likely or even more um, a, a more successful in being able to obtain licenses or measures to enhance the liberalization of environmental goods and services or pilot differential tariffs for sustainable products. I'll end by noting that particularly some interesting examples have been developed to um, reduce the legal trade in forestry products um, and promote trade and investment in sustainable certified wood and to promote indigenous small and medium sized enterprises and trade in indigenous goods. And my colleague Wayne Garnon Williams is working on this right now with a new memorandum of understanding between the Maori and the indigenous people of Canada, the US and also um, some indigenous people of Taiwan. So last few slides. We're going to go quickly here and simply point out that transparency and dispute settlement innovations are crucial. Process makes a difference in negotiating successful provisions that actually help us to turn trade and investment towards the sustainable development goals. And you can look at these impact assessments, you can look at consultations between the different departments, you can look at engagement of the public for transparency, and you can also look at arbitral tribunals and um, expert panels, fact-finding missions, consultations, amicus curiae briefs. There are many different ways, including net zero and green arbitration codes and policies, that we can actually ensure that the process itself helps get us to a more sustainable investment or trade treaty. Next slide, please. So in the end, what are the future trade investment law contributions to the SDGs? Well, the study that we have, which is complex and I won't go into it completely here, simply points to a whole set of different trade and investment agreements that already contain specific and, 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 and in some cases quite innovative provisions on all of the different sustainable development goals, whether it's poverty, hunger, gender equality, sustainable um, access to water or access to renewable energy. Next slide, please. 
as well as other SDGs like um, uh, promoting sustainable consumption and production, uh, ensuring sustainable economic growth and um, inclusive growth and employment, taking action on climate change, conserving and sustainably using the oceans or terrestrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. In all of these SDGs, we can find examples of trade and investment agreements that are actually supporting and fostering rather than frustrating sustainable uh, trade and investment. And I think that that is the way to move forward. Next slide, please. If we track across all of the different regional trade and investment agreements, we can see some very, very interesting examples. We don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to invent entirely new areas and convince everyone that it's necessary and possible to stop trade from hindering sustainable development goals. We can look at the examples that are already there and build on them. Last slide. So trade and sustainable development in the WTO, it's the lowest common denominator. There are um, many details to be worked out. Not all of the uh, best efforts to promote sustainable trade it can be done through a large multilateral institution, but the WTO is trying, trying, and there are many different options that can still be pursued to move forward. Harnessing trade for sustainable development and a green economy. Last slide. More importantly, I think that the study at least shows that States are adopting sustainable development as part of the object and purpose of regional and bilateral treaties. They're also experimenting with innovative pathways to integrate environmental and social considerations into their trade agreements, addressing tensions identified in impact assessments. Those procedural innovations are crucial and there's no one size fits all. You look at the actual economic relationship that exists. If most of their trade is trade and cut flowers, look at the gendered um, social safety net impacts of working with those chemicals and address them. Look at the biodiversity impacts of, looking at, of working with those particular um, plants and address them. Look at the ways that the sustainable fair trade cut flowers can be advantaged in that trading relationship and build on it. <laughs> Look at trade in bicycles instead of trade in oil and gas products. Last slide. Overall, I think that we can close with them. a note from the book itself. The rules which facilitate trade and investment could defend the interests of Hermes, Greek god of commerce and thieves, or could learn to draw inspiration from Athena, goddess of justice, wisdom, and the crafts. I think this session and our marvelous hosts from the IISD with their trade and sustainability hub, and indeed Ngozi's new WTO, all have shown us that that second option really is possible and worthy of all of our support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie Claire, for those wonderful and inspiring opening remarks. So we have a panel of experts now who are going to take you a little more deeply into uh, some specific case studies to, to bring that even more to life. So we're going to start with two speakers who are going to talk to you about environment and climate change in the draft EU Mercosur trade agreement and other EU Americas FTAs. And they are Dr. Fabiano de Andrade Carrera. And um, Fabiano is a lawyer and legal specialist in sustainable development law and policy, experience across public private international sectors. Um, Fabiano works as an international um, legal consultant. He provides technical assistance to implement implementation of the international agreements that Marie Claire's talked about, as well as the promotion of the rule of law and enabling environments at the national level. And he's contributed to projects um, basically all over the world, Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia, um, with various different international organizations, including FAO, IDLO, World Bank, Client Earth, and the UN Environment, focusing on climate change biodiversity and environmental law um, and, and responsible investment. And that's the subject of this panel. Fabiano is joined in this panel by Javiera Caceres, um, who is, uh, works as a consultant for the Inter-American, has worked as a consultant for the Inter-American Development Bank, Chilean Undersecretariat um, of International Economic Affairs and Pro-Chile among others. And she works also works in international trade and sustainable investment 
and development, trade and gender and intellectual property issues. So environment and climate change and some of these EU America's FTAs. Um, looking forward to hearing from you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, for this very kind introduction and for the organizers for the invite. It is a real pleasure to participate in this extremely interesting and timely session. Um, and uh, it is always such a pleasure to listen to Professor Mary Claire, but also a challenge to talk right after her because her, her presentations are always so rich and interesting. But indeed, uh, our presentation now will speak directly to what she was saying and provide a case study of how uh, regional integration agreements uh, can be a, a tool to for more uh, ambitious um, sustainable development and climate change uh, uh, as opposed to the to the difficulty in advancing in a more ambitious way the multilateral route uh, and this uh, this case study uh, is uh, is out of uh, an in-depth uh, anal anal analysis that we have done of the EU uh, and Mercosur trade agreement that was published earlier this year, in which uh, I had the pleasure to work with uh, uh, Javiera and, and Mario Stokas, who we will also speak later on. So I will actually uh, uh, head over to Javiera to deliver our presentation uh, and uh, would very much like uh, to see the audience's comments and thoughts about these issues later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabiano. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you also, Mary Claire and the organizers for this opportunity. As Fabiano said, it's, it's a challenge to speak after Mary Claire, but we'll do our best. So, so as Fabiano was saying, we want to present you the analysis and results of a research regarding the environment and climate change based on an analysis that we conducted on the last available draft of the EU Mercosur trade agreement, which was published after the political conclusion of the negotiation that was achieved in 2019. So well, as you can see on this slide, uh, the main objective of our report was to analyze the incorporation of environmental commitments in the draft EU Mercosur FTA. And also from that analysis, propose some recommendations for potential revisions that can be done within the legal scrubbing process. So for that reason, and for methodological purposes, we divided the analysis into two sections. First, we used both a descriptive and comparative approach to analyze the most relevant chapters within the agreement and identify the areas in which environmental related clauses can be incorporated. After that, a comparative approach was used to explain the significance and restrictions of the environmental commitments found in the trade and sustainable development chapter of the agreement. So we have to consider that uh, accordingly, this second section is an analytical framework of level playing field provisions in FTAs. So for that, in order to establish a benchmark within EU and Mercosur negotiations, the comparative analysis that we conducted was on the one hand based on the latest EU FTA agreements negotiated, for example, with Japan, the economic partnership agreement with Japan, the FTA with Singapore, CETA with South Korea and Vietnam also. And in addition, on the other hand, the agreements between the EU and Latin American and Caribbean countries were considered. For example, the uh, uh, European Union with CARI Forum, um, uh, Peru and Colombia, Central American Association Agreement too. So also as a way of enriching this benchmark and the study, we also analyze and consider the elements included in recently uh, agreements negotiated by Mercosur countries, for example, um, the agreement between Mercosur and Colombia, and the agreement between Uruguay and Chile, Brazil and Chile, and Argentina and Chile. So for this, um, can we please go to the, to, the, to the next section? We also conducted a very interesting international legal experts roundtable. So an initial version of this report with the first conclusions was, was circulated among the community of practice comprised by 38 experts, practitioners, academics, and stakeholders from both 
Europe, the, Euro, the European Union and Mercosur countries. This in order to first strengthen our analysis. And also we invited all these experts to send their comments and suggestions on this initial report and then help us to gather the information and draft um, all the amendments proposed for the EU and Mercosur agreement. So as we can see uh, on the screen, this expert round table was focused on four main points. First on strengthening, that's it's not on the on the screen, but it should say strengthening environmental governments in trade in goods chapters. This is because trade in goods chapters are fundamental part of trade agreements. So changing and including a more environmental perspective on these uh, and on these chapters may constitute a stepping stone towards environmental governance objectives. Second, we also focused on addressing intellectual property rights and dispute settlement mechanism in the agreement. I mean, as we know, uh, the, the chapter, the sustainable development chapter is excluded for the dispute settlement mechanism. So also in the context of intellectual property issues, technology transfer and capacity building are relevant tools to support sustainable development. So that's something that we also covered during the experts round table. Third, um, we focus on provisions for sustainable development subsidies, market access, uh, trade barriers, and SPS measures. So even though the, this agreement, the EU Mercosur agreement, does not deepen the subsidy section, the incorporation of specific disciplines or exceptions on grid subsidies can contribute to sustainable de development. So that was also something that we covered throughout the experts round table. And finally, we also focus on protecting biodiversity and combating climate change. So we know that the protection of biodiversity uh, has been incorporated in the agreement, but uh, as even though it makes a specific reference to, for example, the conventional bio, bio, biological diversity, uh, still some changes could be incorporated. Can we go to the next slide, please, please? So here, just to show you, because um, I don't think we have much time to cover all this, but as an overall assessment, as I said, uh, we, we, we divided the analysis into the main uh, parts, chapters of the agreement. So for example, in the case of the preamble, uh, the analysis shows that uh, all agreements um, signed and negotiated by the European Union referred to sustainable development. Nevertheless, there is no publicly available, there was no publicly available preamble for this agreement. So that couldn't be incorporated in the analysis. We have, for example, in the case of trading goods and rules of origins, we can see that this section only referred to environmental considerations as part of general exceptions. So for that, no positive actions nor defensive provisions to these respects were included. But we pointed out that tariff reduction may be used to stimulate environmental goods, including energy saving products, environmental monitoring products, amongst others. And that has been incorporated in the EU-Colombia approval agreement. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so here, also on the overall assessment, we can see how uh, the importance of government procurement and subsidies, technical barriers. So for example, in the case of technical barriers to trade and sanitary and phytosanitary measures, we can see that the SPS chapter does not address the precautionary principle, it, but it is important to see that this agreement, the agreement establishes a dialogue section between the parties on animal welfare matters which will be very important also for its implementation. In the case of intellectual property, it is interesting to see that uh, the current version only refers to parties' effort to the, the patent cooperation treaty, so there's no more information. But in case of other uh, intellectual property rights, we can point out, for example, what has been done in the EU South Korea FTA, when where it is recognized the importance of biodiversity and traditional knowledge, for example, and also the EU CARIFORM agreement includes a cooperation clause, clause to preserve local traditional knowledge and biodiversity through geographical indication. Next slide, please. 
And well, when we, we, we got to the trade and sustainable development chapter here, it, it's very interesting to see how in the aim and objectives, we see that uh, the agreement recalls international agreements, but they only perform an interpretation function as they are not incorporated in the corpus of the treaty. We can see also that in terms of multilateral environmental agreements, there's no reference to a specific uh, in multilateral environmental agreements in the EU-Mercosur, for example. But it is interesting to see that the agreement highlights four specific aspects of trade and environmental sustainable development. For example, trade and climate change, trade and biodiversity, trade and sustainable management of forests, and also trade and sustainable management of fisheries and aquaculture. Next, please. Also, we, we analyze the obligation not to weaken standards and transparency and cooperation clauses. And we can see, for example, in the case of transparency and cooperation clauses that the chapter reinforces cooperation as a soft power mechanism for sustainable development. And in terms of the enforcement mechanism that um, this chapter is formally excluded from the main dispute settlement system. So maybe we can go on to the conclusions of the presentation. Thank you. So overall, this analysis, the results of this, of this analysis show that newer EU trade agreements contain more provisions in terms of sustainable development and environmental protection at different levels, showing that this specific agreement, the one that we, we, we analyzed, falls behind from the current practice on those terms. Nevertheless, it is important to highlight that um, in the case of the TSD chapter, we have a further, we have more provisions in terms of cooperation activities than the other agreements that we analyzed. But due to its exclusion from the dispute sensible mechanism, its enforcement remains subjected to parties' political will, which is something that also Mary Claire um, referred to, which is important for the compliance of these provisions. Also, we can see that besides the TZ chapter, there are minimum environmental related provisions throughout the agreement. So the TZ chapter contains, uh, follows the structure and content promoted by the EU at this time. And this agreement will fall behind other EU negotiations. Finally, it's important to highlight that from this analysis, um, we, 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 we came out with 40, to, uh, 42 proposals, which were, which were divided into two sections. So for example, we have on, on the first annex of the, of, the, of, the, of the publication, we have 14 proposals that can be part of the legal scrubbing process of the agreement because they clarify and rephrase existing provision. They also strengthen cooperation activities and develop commitments in areas of common interest. And also we have in the other annex, we have 28 amendments that can be considered for future stages in the agreement. So these provisions, these 28 provisions focus on issues in which parties have not reached an agreement or which have not previously negotiated. So those were the 42 amendments that we proposed for the agreements based on this analysis. So finally, we all just we just want to please next slide, please. Finally, we just want to invite you all to download the report and we appreciate your participation in this activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier and Fabiano. Um, that's brilliant. And, and we've got time for um Q and A um, at the end as well. So, so moving to our next speaker, Professor um, Ilaria Raspa is going to talk to us about the ILA guidelines for sustainable natural resources management uh, for development. And Ilaria is an assistant professor at the International Economic um, Professor of International Economic Law at USI Lugano and a senior research fellow and lecturer at the WTI and at the University of Milan. And she's an elected member of the um, ILA Committee on the Role of International Sustainable Resources Management for Development and Sustainable Development in the Green Economy and International Trade Law, also a lead counsel for um, CISDL's Natural Resources Programme. So, Ilaria, the ILA guidelines, another really exciting CISDL um, 
um, um, and ILA project. Over to you. Thank you so much, um, Wendy, and thanks a lot to ISD, to IISD and the organizers for having us here. As mentioned, I'm going to be mainly talking uh, in my capacity as lead counsel of the CISDL Natural Resources Program and a member of the ILA committee that Wendy just mentioned, where many of us have served for the past eight years, including, of course, uh, uh, Mary Claire as our rapporteur. So at the Natural Resources Program, we've been building on the work that was done within this committee. And as mentioned, within the committee, we had the task to investigate the role and the legal status of the principle of sustainable use of natural resources, which uh, the ILA defined back uh, into 2002 uh, with the New Delhi Declaration and then with the 2012 SOFIA guidance statements. So we basically uh, very briefly analyzed the myriad of principles of rules of international law related to sustainable management of natural resources. We analyzed the practice of state, the practice of international organizations in the field, uh, the ever increasing number of decisions of international courts and tribunals. And really, we are trying to understand to which extent international law has been changing over time to meet the challenges linked to natural resources management. Really having in mind how central they are for the furtherance of sustainable development if managed properly and sustainably. And as Mary Claire was also saying, uh, to achieve progress towards the world SDGs, especially at the very crucial time with the triple planetary crisis, the COVID pandemic and the challenge of building back better. Now, how does this relate uh, to trade and investment? <laughs> of course, you have to understand that, and this is basically my main point, that the trade and investment and uh, evolutions and innovations really play a crucial roles in progressively developing international law on sustainable uh, natural resources management. And in this respect, what I want to really stress in this uh, very limited time I have is that even though trade and investment may at the first glance be considered as areas that are peripheral uh, to the development of natural resources, we do assist the number of very interesting trends that we've underlined in a specific uh, section of part two of the guidelines uh, um, with the aim of, to accommodate for sustainable natural resources management concern. Now, in the interest of time, I shall perhaps focus on the trade arena. Um, my task is relatively easier after the excellent presentations by Marie Claire and by um, Fabiano and Javiera, because we did already talk about about um, the importance of um, trade and sustainable development chapters and a number of other arrangements that we see in PTAs of latest generation, such as for programs for collaborations of the parties to implement mutual commitments on the side of environment or sustainable development. And we do uh, see an ever increasing wide range of topics that are addressed through these chapters covering environmental concerns, such as climate change, biodiversity, management of forests, as it was underlined, and also trade-related environmental issues such as renewable energy subsidies, fishing subsidies, trading timber, fish products, uh, trade in environmental goods and services. This has already been mentioned. So what I'd like to uh, briefly um, um, underline is that normally the usual critiques to the importance of such TSD chapter is that um, they are short both in normativity and enforceability. Uh, why? Because these provisions are rather drafted in promotional or programmatic um, uh, ways, uh, and also because uh, in many instances, uh, for instance, in EU uh, PTAs, which are um, actually among the most innovative, uh, subchapters include ad hoc regimes for enforcement, which are non-binding and which depart from the general procedure in the envisaged for the settlement of disputes. Now, both criticisms could be addressed by looking very briefly at the most recent case that has arisen within the context of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, a case which I was directly involved on that I'd like to mention because it is in a way related to natural resources management because it issue where some export restrictions that Ukraine had apply on a number of wood products, which she defended for the sake of um, sustainable conservation and management of its forests. 
And it is useful to understand how the fact that the scope and reach of sustainably, sustainability related provisions in trade agreements has been widening can impact the interpretation of PTA rules that are actually squarely regulating trade matters and which are indeed subject to binding dispute settlement rules. Now, in that case, basically the arbitration panel affirmed that the fact that as specifically as this chapter exists could actually bear a relevance also with respect to cases that concern violation of basic trade obligations, which pose immediate, clear, precise um, obligations. Such provision, uh, provisions such as the prohibition of quantitative restriction. And more specifically, it stated that even though those provisions cannot cure in and of themselves existing conflicts with such purely trade-related provisions uh, that are binding among the parties, um, which arise out of trade uh, chapters, they can still serve as relevant context for the interpretation of other trade provisions, which allow the parties to introduce or maintain measures in derogation to applicable obligations for environmental reasons. So basically, in other words, TSD provisions could not be relied upon to justify measures that are incompatible with basic trade obligations that arise out of PTAs, but they can still influence the interpretation of applicable exceptions, which are available under those chapters in the agreement. And in that case, very importantly, the arbitration panel stretched the interpretation of those available public policy exceptions, in particular an Article 20B-like exception, um, uh, Article 36 of the Association Agreement, precisely um, interpreting the necessity test in a way more flexible way in order to um, uh, basically accommodate for one of the measures at issue and consider that it could be justified. And it very importantly argued that it was as a result of the requirement to interpret such exceptions harmoniously with the TSD provisions that were applicable to the case. So uh, I think this is a very interesting development. Um, of course, uh, this uh, builds on the fact that, as I mentioned, PTAs are clearly more innovative, although we do see certain progress also achieved at the multilateral level. I don't want to enter into detail, but we do have a string of uh, WTO cases that show an increasing receptivity towards accommodating for sustainable natural resourcing exception. I can mention a few without entering the details. Uh, China Rehearse, China Raw Materials, but also the tuna case that was also mentioned by uh, Mary Claire in her slides. And we do assist at the renewed ambition on the negotiating front uh, at the WTO with the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions, the TETS, which I'm happy to talk about uh, perhaps in the Q&A uh, session. Um, also, 30 seconds in international um, investment law, we also uh, see significant step forwards toward um, sustainable natural resources management concerns um, that uh, basically are um, implemented through innovations in international investment agreements. Um, and we do see that also uh, incorporated and reflected in an emerging string of cases as well, especially exit cases um, uh, that I won't go into detail in the interest of time. Uh, but this is just to say that international trade and investment regimes have been developing to accommodate not just on reactively, but also proactively for sustainable natural resources management concern. And they could arguably play an even more important role in the future as more innovations consolidate uh, in treaty making progresses. Uh, but um, even if progress on the normative side languishes or uh, it's still uh, up in the road, especially at the multilateral level. The systems have already the potential for avoiding clashes between um, sustainable resources management and trade and investment liberalization. So the final message we do uh, convey through the guidelines at trade and is that trade and investment regimes can be seen as an integral part of the more general development of international law on the sustainable management of natural resources for development. Uh, and if you're interested, I do invite to please do have a look at our ILA guidelines. Thank you so much. And I look Thank forward to the discussion.
Thank you so much, Alaria, and such a huge piece of work in there. So do look at them. Now we're just going to, um, in the interest of time, we're just going to adjust slightly. So Alexandra, Dr. Harrington, please get ready because we're coming to you next. So Alexandra is going to talk about connections between trade governance regimes and the sustainable development goal. So sort of closing the circle a little bit on where Marie Claire started. We still want time for um, discussion, which we have scheduled from 1 to 1.15. So Marcus and I will just sort of um, make our remarks quick and closing to leave time. There's an interesting question already on certificates of origin, but do put your uh, questions in because that's often the most fun part. So Dr. Alexandra Harrington is next research director, senior fellow at McGill, professor at the University of Albany Law School and Fulbright Canada Special Foundation Fellow at the um, Valsley School of International Affairs in Waterloo, author of the book on international organizations and the law and a forthcoming book on international law and global governance, treaty regimes and sustainable development goals interpretation. I don't know where these women get time to write these books on top of everything else. Alexandra is um, Director of Studies for the International Law Association Colombian Branch, member of the ILA Committee on the Role of International Law and Sustainable Natural Resources Management for Development as well. Um, and um, um, a very, very well qualified and experienced uh, for the topic that she's about to address. So Alex, great to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Wendy. And I never, I always feel absolutely like I will never live up to the introduction. So thank you very much. Um, and I apologize, Marcus and Wendy for taking some of your time as per the initial schedule. I will try to do everything I can to give you a couple extra minutes. Um, but to really kind of round out the discussion today, um, what I wanted to talk about and what actually is is coming from a, a chapter in um, or several chapters in the book that Wendy referenced, which is now out on um, unsustainable development goals and global governance, is the idea of how we think about trade governance regimes um, as potential tools for the advancement or potentially the negative impact, but we will be hopeful and say the advancement of the sustainable development goals. Um, and first of all, when we think about the idea of trade governance regimes, Marie Claire pointed out very well that we often think about the WTO, and indeed there's a very strong reason for this. The WTO is, is obviously the most entrenched. It is the one that we do think of most when we think of global trade and global trade regimes. Um, and certainly it has the strongest in many ways, arguably, um, governance systems, right? So it has the dispute settlement body, it has a number of different committees and councils which look at issues that relate to sustainable development. Um, we think of the Committee on Agriculture, we think of the Committee on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures, um, and even especially in the context now of the pandemic as well as climate change, the Committee on Technical Barriers to Trade. So all of these things kind of come together to form a very significant governance system within the overall international organization that is the WTO. Um, but it should also be borne in mind that there are a number of other governance regimes that relate to trade. And what we often don't discuss, and what I'm so glad to have heard so many of my colleagues refer to today, is the idea of uh, free trade agreements or regional trade agreements as being instruments of not only trade facilitation, but also trade governance with an eye towards um, sustainable development, environmental concerns, and increasingly as we are um, trying to figure out and starting to figure out how to live with COVID and, and how we handle the various COVID upticks, et cetera, um, public health issues and the emergence of public health concerns. Um, in this context, it is important to remember also for free trade agreements that they exist to govern um, trade, to govern investment, often to govern taxation, but they also create a number of different bodies that are governance bodies that we often actually discuss in the, the governance realm as being quite innovative. Um, and that can greatly further it's a, the sustainable development goals. So we think of joint review committees, we think of internal dispute settlement systems. So we think of systems where 
There may be disputes between the parties over particular aspects of implementing an agreement, and we create a means of actually handling that internally, not necessarily to avoid transparency issues as much as to provide some level of parity and some level of expertise within the overall regime. And we also have seen, especially in the context of uh, what was NAFTA, what now is the USMCA, the emergence of parallel bodies and parallel agreements that relate to things like labor and environment, um, including the very successful NAAC in uh, the USMCA NAFTA context where we have a separate body that addresses issues of sustainable development and economic um, growth and economic development, as well as environmental concerns at the national legal level of all of the states that are signatories, as well as um, at the, the international level with how we look at now the USMCA and previously NAFTA in terms of implementation. But all of this is, is fascinating to people who love governance, to many who don't love governance, it's 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 an entity, it's a thing. Um, but what is really interesting to look at is some of the intersections with the sustainable development goals, especially those that are not necessarily obvious. So we have discussed already this morning, um, or at least it's morning for me uh, in New York still, um, several SDGs that are perhaps more obvious in this context. So we think about SDG 7, for example, on affordable and clean energy access. This is quite clearly a trade issue. And actually, there currently is um, a matter pending before the WTO dispute settlement body on issues relating to, uh, to renewable energy access and trade between the US and India. Um, we think of SDG 8 on decent work. And in particular, what is fascinating um, in this context to think about the linkages is that the original GATT itself, so from post-World War II, um, actually contains language saying that international trade under GATT is to be conducted with a view to raising standards of living, ensuring full employment, and a large and steadily growing volume of real income for individuals. So it's much more than just the idea of having decent work that won't kill you. It's really the idea of having work that is going to facilitate a better social outcome and using trade to do this. Um, we also think of SDG 12, um, sustainable consumption and production patterns. And as we've talked about a great deal already, SDG 17 for partnerships. But what is often not discussed is the other complement of SDGs that are in existence and that really do work quite well with trade governance regimes like the WTO and all of its internal mechanisms, and uh, as well as trade agreements, free trade agreements, regional trade agreements. And many of these have become more powerful for us as we have approached the pandemic and as we now try to figure out the post-pandemic or kind of pandemic aware world. Um, specifically SDG 2 relating to food security. And we saw this a great deal during uh, the early months of the pandemic when there were so many restrictions on how uh, trade was to go forth between different countries where we knew that COVID was present in some of those countries and many restrictions were put in place. Um, SDG 3 on health is perhaps the most obvious as well as the complement of the climate and environmental SDGs. So SDG 13, 14 and 15, where we look at collectively climate change, land use uh, and, and life on land and life below water as all intimately connected with the ideas that we see in the emerging types of governance systems coming from the WTO, coming especially out of free trade agreements where we see a number of provisions and patterns emerging where there are um, explicit protections for environment as well as the inclusion of sustainable development. And certainly we know that there are a number of WTO dispute settlement body cases coming up, which will be looking at these issues and how they relate to what we think of as um, WTO law now, because it has been so previously confined to the terms, strict terms of the treaties without really a great deal of ex exploration of what the uh, public health and safety um, and morals exceptions might be with the possible exception of the shrimp turtle case, which many of us are all too familiar with. 
Um, and finally, SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. And I raised this last but in no way least because it does relate specifically to transparency. And the WTO and free trade agreement systems, while they often are discussed in some terms in, of a negative transparency in terms of being much more um, removed from the public eye than, for example, the UN General Assembly, still are very transparent in terms of making documents available, making information available, and are increasingly making information related to, for example, the pandemic and its relationship to trade easily and readily accessible to all citizens, not just those of us who are very boring lawyers with no lives. Wendy, that's why we write all these books because we're very boring and we have no lives. Um, so just to end and to point out that as we look into the idea of, um, of the post-pandemic world, there are many things to look at in terms of how trade regimes respond and how they address the SDGs in the process. Um, and when we think about this, we need to think about things like vaccine equity and medication equity. Um, indeed, I just saw a description of a plan or a future plan for certainly the US and the EU where um, at-home testing followed by confirmation of COVID and then um, treatment by a physician, including with medication, is to be the standard practice. If this is the case, um, and vaccination obviously as well, if this is the case, we see a number of areas where there will be trade impacts and the potential for nationalism and protectionism in international trade to become very much problematic. Um, so regulating it will be critical. And this obviously furthers SDG 3 on health as well as SDG 1 on poverty. And we've seen these concerns, especially in the past week, come out of the Republic of South Africa with the restrictions that were placed on people flying in and out of South Africa as a result of the Omicron variant, um, and also SDG 10 on reduced inequalities. And looking forward, certainly the idea of building back better or scaling up in recovery measures um, will have a direct link with trade. And the question is, how do we take what we know about the Sustainable Development Goals and what we know about trade governance regimes and merge them together so that there can be proper governance from a trade perspective of these efforts to build back better while at the same time ensuring that they are able to be written and implemented in a way that forwards sustainable development goal implementation and also addresses issues like climate change. So thank you very much. I apologize for taking any extra time and I will be quiet now. That was absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Alex. And um, the law is your life and thank heavens from the rest of us for that. Um, Marcus, Dr. Gearing. Um, we we um, would love to hear, and I think we have time because we've got a couple of questions that um, we'll get to freedom and blessing very, very quickly to moderate. But um, we do have time, I think, for sustainable development implications from the recent um, UK-EU FTA treaty, which is an important one and very, very current, um, about the treaty making practice and the um, TCA. So tell us all about it, the UK sort of, you know, Lord yeah, of what a, at COP, how did it come out? <laughs> thank you very much, uh, uh, Wendy Miles QC. Um, uh, it's been such a rich roundtable that I don't want to uh, take more time uh, for people. I will uh, confine my comments that the trade and cooperation agreement that the EU and the UK uh, concluded is probably constituting the high watermark uh, in the trade and sustainable development uh, debates. It's the first trade treaty uh, that makes the climate crisis a make it or break it issue. It has very strong provisions on no um, non-regression uh, provisions. Um, so the, the level of environmental uh, sustainable development and climate protection cannot be rolled back um, without foregoing uh, trade concessions between the partners. This has never been done. Now, granted, this is a less free trade agreement because of course uh, there was free movement of goods between the UK and the rest of the European Union before the trade and cooperation agreement, but Nonetheless, it sends a signal what is possible 
in a very progressive trade agreement. And we've, uh, we've published a couple of papers, we've published our analysis. The TCA really is now the benchmark for trade and climate change, for trade and sustainable development. And I would be very surprised if not more countries would agree the, 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 the elements of, for example, um, creating provisions on material breach, uh, if climate targets, if the NDCs, if the commitments under the Paris Agreement are not achieved. Uh, and President Macron has said as much that he wishes for uh, any future EU trade agreement to comply with that uh, kind of new standard. I leave it at that. I can also just uh, highlight that, um, uh, yeah, I, I invite you all to study the provisions. Now, there are some challenges in the, uh, in the implementation of that very progressive trade agreement, uh, but that is inherent in any uh, trade agreement. And uh, before we open to uh, all the uh, question and answers, could I quickly invite uh, Wendy Miles QC to talk to us briefly about mobilizing private capital for the SDGs, balancing investor protection and the right to regulate. Wendy, you've got the floor very quickly because I want time for those questions and for um, freedom and blessing. So um, just we've, we've talked a lot about the new treaties and the new frameworks. They're important. But as Marie Claire pointed out, there's still 3000 plus existing treaties, um, even if uh, terminated, have long sunset provisions. So so we have an existing world. And I think in addition to new treaty making, including these umbrella treaties like the ACCTS, which set general standards. I think there's also an important uh, role um, in putting the capital, the investment direction um, in the right place. There's an important role for the interpretation of existing treaties. So there's an important role for the dispute resolution mechanisms in the existing treaties and for the stakeholders involved in that process um, to make sure that, that their decision-making reflects this change in, in, in direction, um, in, in the general movement um, towards sustainable investment. Um, and then um, separately, the um, changes and the evolution in the regulatory environment, the legislative environment, that too sort of regulates what goes on um, in trade and investment uh, globally, and, and not least to set the legitimate expectations of the parties, the foreign investors who are investing under these treaties. Um, so I think uh, um, the only other sort of instrument that needs to come into the whole consideration is the contract, um, the investment agreement, usually a public-private partnership agreement. Let me just outline for you two big concerns I have about mobilising capital for the SDGs. My first concern is so much of the focus right now is on critical path for SDG 13, climate action decarbonisation. I am worried that we will start replacing counting dollars with counting carbon and, and the other 16 SDGs will become subsidiary to that. And I think we need to make sure that as um, investment protection shifts towards ensuring that those carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction objectives are reached, that it doesn't lose sight of the other 16 sustainable development goals. I think that's critically, critically important. The second thing that I worry about, and you know, I've been trying to figure out which, which SDG it fits under, um, and it's come up in some of the chat, um, is, is the um, natural resources, the extractives. Where does it fit? Kind of maybe under SDG uh, 15, life on land, kind of maybe under SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, it doesn't clearly fit under anywhere. So I think I am concerned that we are looking about at a one way direction of travel and mobilizing private capital. We talk so much about this 130 trillion and we talk about as being movement of capital from global north to global south, from developed countries to developing countries. But hey, guess what? It's primarily in those developing countries where the resources lie. 
that are the key to transition. You can't build wind farms without steel, without aluminium, without rare earth minerals, etc. So I think we need to just get our heads around the whole idea that the whole trade environment geopolitically is shifting. We need something globally from developing countries. Um, and there is a real equality of arms in this new negotiating regime. And I, I think we have to shift our thinking on that, which I is a really nice way, freedom and blessing, I hope. Welcome both of you um, to that first question on the certificate of origins. So over to you both. So just given the limitations on time, I, I'm going to raise Ellen Barker's question, which is in your view, what is the role or importance of the rules of origin regulation for sustainable development efforts? And then I'll also take moderator's prerogative to throw one out regarding Article 6.2. So given the party's need to maintain a high level of environmental integrity and subsequently report through biennial transparency reporting, we could see the potential for unilateral restrictions to the transfer of most based on the particular type, character, or vintage. What would be the impl implications of classifying it most as either a product, service, or financial instrument under the WTO? And what might the defenses be to parties taking these unilateral restrictions to enable high environmental integrity? Marcus had his hand up. Yes, um, uh, so if I can uh, just briefly uh, address the, the last uh, point, I mean, on rules of origin, I, I think they have received uh, too little attention. Uh, I think we need to review um, the sustainability of some of the rules of origin as they're currently crafted. Um, they have been always aiming at, at more liberal approaches. But of course, uh, the way you cast your rules of origin can also create new obstacles, can uh, create unsustainable trade practices. Uh, we see the dispute between Canada and the US this week, for example, on uh, treating electric cars uh, only as electric if they're assembled uh, with uh, American batteries. Um, that is not exactly uh, the most sustainable way of doing international trade. Um, I think unilateral uh, measures need to be a last resort, but uh, unilateral measures that are non-discriminatory and lead to a level playing field, I don't think create major uh, WTO law concerns. I know there might be different opinions in the audience here, um, but uh, I think we need to uh, see the reality that um, some of the environmental uh, levels that we are achieving are reaching such high levels that uh, we need to either agree international balancing measures with our trading partners or other forms of international cooperation in order to avoid unilateral measures. Wendy, can I just like uh, add, build up yeah, on what Marcus said? 30 seconds. Marius, can we, 30 seconds? Yes, 30 okay. seconds. Okay. Elaria, please. I just wanted to follow up what Marcus said um, regarding rules of origin, which is an extremely complex issue. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that uh, question gives us the chance to also um, really uh, mentioned how important it would be to reach a multilateral deal because, of course, rules of origin are critical in order to grant tariff preferences to uh, preferential partners, right, within the PDA. So, depending on what type of plurilateral deal we finally achieve, for instance, on the environmental goods initiative, um, expanding whatever um, reductions and elimination of duties on environmental goods on an FM, on, on an MFM basis could, to a certain to a, a big extent, um, reduce the fears that rules of origin could be used as a tool to unsustainably follow up <laughs> on these issues. So I just wanted to mention that we do have tools within the multilateral regime uh, to avoid those, those dangers. OK. 
Okay. Um, blessing, freedom. Um, I think there are other questions, but I think we're out of time. We're over our time and um, um, the organizers need to move to the next session. So Marcus, would you like to close? No, just uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, thank you in particular to ISD for organizing this wonderful uh, trade and sustainability hub. I hope that when we have MC12 in uh, March or April, that we will uh, come together again. And uh, my special go things go to Mario Tokas, uh, who as uh, uh, Associate Legal Fellow of the CSTL has brought us all together to, to share our research and to interact with the international community. I, I see uh, good friends like uh, Vera, um, Elizabeth, and Natalie in the audience, thank you so much for participating and please interact with what we you've heard and you've seen.